There's fury in the White House as a new book lays bad Donald Trump's first year in office. The U.S. president has slammed it, calling the author a loser. But what are the ramifications of this book for the Middle East and Trump's presidency? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahalbara. There's so much demand for a new book on Donald Trump. Source can't keep up with demand. Its publishers had to release it early after the president's lawyers threatened to sue them and the former White House advisor, Steve Bannon. The book is written by Michael Wolf and draws a picture of the chaotic first year in office. Trump has slammed it as phony. But what will be the impact of Wolf's work? We'll get to our guests in just a moment. But first, Dan Estabrook reports from Washington, D.C. Crowds swarmed this Washington bookstore at midnight Friday, snatching up copies of Fire and Fury inside the Trump White House. Because of uh, the crowds right now, I can't take your order over the phone. Politics and Prose opened at 10 a.m. Within 30 minutes, eager buyers had nabbed all 30 copies the store had. I'm super excited to read this. I went to a couple of different bookstores. Even midnight last night, there was a, another bookstore selling this. They sold out in 20 minutes. Why are you so interested in this book? Why would I not be interested in this book? It is so salacious and juicy. Um, I'm a politics diehard, and I just can't wait to read it. At 320 pages, this is a relatively light tome, but it is filled with explosive material. The author, Michael Wolf, said he spent 18 months conducting about 200 interviews with senior White House staff. In one passage, Wolf says former British Prime Minister Tony Blair offered this nugget of information to the president's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. There was, he suggested, the possibility that the British had had the Trump campaign staff under surveillance. Blair is denying the claim. Another passage describes a potential change in Saudi Arabia the president was considering before his trip last spring to the Middle East. In the days before his departure, he was telling people that the Saudis were going to finance an entirely new military presence in the kingdom, supplanting and even replacing the U.S. command headquarters in Qatar. Fire and Fury wasn't supposed to be released until Tuesday, but the book's publisher moved the date up after attorneys for President Trump issued a cease and desist letter threatening legal action. In an interview Friday morning, author Michael Wolf stood by his book and added this observation. The one description that, that everyone gave, everyone has in common, they all say he is like a child. And what they mean by that is he has an, a need for immediate gratification. It's all about him. The White House is labeling fire and fury tabloid trash. President Trump wouldn't answer questions about the book Friday afternoon, but tweeted, I never spoke to him for the book. Full of lies, misrepresentations, and sources that don't exist. Still, fire and fury is yet another distraction for a White House that is trying to advance, among other things, a new immigration plan and a spending plan to avoid a looming government shutdown. Diane Estabrook, Al Jazeera, Washington. As Diane mentioned, Wolf's book includes a wide array of interviews and covers a range of topics. For today's episode, we want to focus on what Wolf says about Trump's Middle East policy. For example, his support of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, as he's known, had assumed that position in June, soon after Trump's visit to Riyadh. Wolf writes, Within weeks of the trip, MBS detaining Mohammed bin Naif quite in the dead of night would force him to relinquish the Crown Prince title. Trump would tell friends that he and Jared Kushner had engineered this. We've put our man on top. Let's bring in our guests. Joining us on the set here in Doha, Mohammed Salqawi, Professor of Conflict Resolution at George Mason University. In Beirut, Rami Khouri, Senior Public Policy Fellow and Adjunct Professor of Journalism at the American University of Beirut. And in London, Ian Black, Visiting Senior Fellow at the London School of Economics, Middle East Center. Welcome to you all. So, Mohammed Shalqawi, I would like to ask you this. We've, we've read the excerpts of the book. They show us some, uh, they offer us a glimpse into the inner workings of the Trump administration, particularly when it comes to the Middle East. 
Does the Trump administration has a real strategy when it comes to the Middle East? Well, first, let's see, or at least let's acknowledge that this is a well-documented account of the dynamics of the Trump's world, as well as his approach to foreign policy. Now we have seen there is this interesting revelation that Trump has or had a major role in pushing or paving the way for Mohammed bin Salman to be the new decision maker in Riyadh. The issue here is how far we are accepting mm -hmm. this reality that there is a U.S. or a Trumpist involvement, a deliberate involvement. At the same time, it, it proves one thing, that Trump believes in the club of the powerful man. He prefers to deal with individuals who have some clout instead of dealing with institutions or governments. Mm -hmm. The question remains how far this Trump, Ben Salman, CC, Tuarte and Philippines can last for a long time. Mr. Khoury, I mean, generally speaking, the idea that we have is that um, when it comes to like the White, the White House, you would have chief strategists connecting the dots, putting the maps and planning the future. Sadly, what we get from the book is series of machinations and intrigues. Does it come as a surprise to you or do you think this is quite normal in that environment? It's normal for the Trump White House. It's not normal for previous White Houses. Uh, and I've been involved with uh, talking to people and reporting on these issues for about the last 45 years, uh, talking, offering to people in the White House, in Washington and other places. So this is very uh, Trump-related policy making. It's very individualized. It's based on a lot of uh, ignorance uh, about the realities of the Middle East, uh, which is the area we're talking about now. Uh, and also total disdain and disregard for the 400 million people who are the citizens of the Arab world. They're dealing with individuals, as, um, as Mohammed just said, they, they deal with uh, Sisi, Mohammed bin Salman, Netanyahu, uh, and that's about it. Uh, the others are, are secondary. They don't particularly care about the, what happens to the people in the Middle East. They're interested in their own partnerships with these people. Um, and they're mostly uh, basing this on a relationship between two people who are acting uh, essentially like adolescents, which is uh, Mohammed bin Salman and Jared Kushner, young guy, people, 32, 33 years old, no experience, no accountability to anybody, and they do whatever they want. And this is very adolescent type behavior. People get to like each other. Oh, you're my buddy. I can, I can do a deal with you. And, and we're seeing the consequences. Mm. Uh, of this. So this is very peculiar to this White House. It's also extremely dangerous. Mr. Black, I mean, it's, it's really been interesting times you know, since June. The crisis in uh, the GCC crisis, the, the blockade imposed on Qatar, the Trump's decision, decision on Jerusalem, the rhetoric against Iran, all those series of uh, uh, leading to loads of confusion in this part of the world. Now, when you read the book, does it do you get to the point where you say, oh, now I do understand why this is a very chaotic scenario unfolding in the region? Well, my, my impression is that the, the extracts that I've seen from the book relating to the, the Middle East, my overwhelming feeling is that it's actually really consistent with everything that we've seen so far. I mean, actually, we know an awful lot about how these things work. What we have in this book is the, the uh, filtered through the, uh, in the work of an experienced journalist, we have uh, eyewitness accounts of how things work on the inside. So for example, on the question of US-Saudi Arabian relations, which is probably the most interesting part of the Middle Eastern chapter, um, we, we, we have Trump boasting. We've got our man, we've put our man on top. Now, this is not a work of historical research. It's what people are saying. It's what people are quoting. But that's entirely consistent with everything that we've seen so far. What I think is important to remember, and this comes out across the book and in the storm surrounding it and the inevitable you know, Twitter wars that are going on, is that Trump boasts. He says, I did this. I have delivered. I am doing things that other US presidents have failed to do. Now, that doesn't mean it's necessarily true. But I think that the insight is there, that that's how he, Trump, 
presents it. We could mm -hmm. talk about bin Salman and his motives and how he may have used Trump. That's a slightly different question. But Trump, overall, is a man who boasts about what he has done. Taking credit of the achievements or what has been achieved, but we will definitely have to look now in, in details about some of those major decisions taken in the region. The blockade on Qatar, which is entering its seventh month, was also mentioned in Wolf's book. He writes, the president, ignoring if not defying foreign policy advice, gave a nod to the Saudis' plan to bully Qatar. Trump's view was that Qatar was providing financial support to terror groups, pays no attention to a similar Saudi history. Mr. Sarqawi, I mean, this is someone who builds this relationship with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, who becomes crown prince in Saudi Arabia. He says, we'll get back in from you in exchange. We'll give the go-ahead for the bullying of Qatar. Is this something new in the way politics is conducted in the United States of America? Well, as a young student, I was always admiring what is known the American exceptionalism that started a long time ago with the values of the 14 points of Woodrow Wilson at the beginning of the century or the Kennedy Doctrine. Now I see a huge decline of moral politics in the U.S. in favor of some calculated or maybe the ugly face of political realism. We don't see a doctrine here. We don't see a manifesto that has certain strategies. Basically, it's the impulses, the guts, and some tendencies of a powerful man at the White House who feels that he is uh, qualified enough to reorganize international politics and maybe to think of the Middle East as this piece of chess, he can move things as long as he finds the right strong man to mm. implement and to sort of do the, the political dance with him. Mr. Khouri, the segment that we've run just now about Qatar, I mean, we've, 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 we've talked extensively over the last few months about the, the blockade, but just this is something which is really intriguing. Someone who gives the go ahead for the plan by the Saudis to bully Qatar without looking into the consequences of a decision. Isn't this something which should be a source of concern for, for many people in the United States of America? Absolutely, and you're seeing the consequences. You know, two days ago, or yesterday, at the Security Council, the United States called the session and, and the U.S. was almost totally isolated, and people were lecturing the United States about its ridiculous policies on Iran and on Jerusalem. Uh, so th there is a huge consequence to all of these actions, not just the consequence of U.S. actions, but the consequence of um, Mohammed bin Salman's actions, the consequence of Israeli continued colonial actions, uh, autocracy getting tighter in Egypt and all across the region. And the U.S. is supporting regimes and leaderships that are doing really uh, rough things to their own people um, and to their neighbors. But to be, uh, uh, to be fair to Trump, I disagree with the idea that there is no tra strategy or plan. I've been watching them closely. I just spent three months in the United States. Uh, my sense, and the, the documentation in this book t t tends to support this, my sense is that, that there are two strands, uh, or maybe three strands, to American consistent policy in the Middle East. One is to do anything to oppose and push back Iran, and that's not really defined, but that's generally one. The second one is to basically do almost anything that uh, the Israeli government wants or people like Sheldon Adelson, the big donor in Las Vegas who supports pro-Israeli right-wing uh, ultra-nationalist groups like Netanyahu and people like that, and, and they gave Trump 25 or $35 million, it's reported. So they, they do anything to support these people. Uh, and the third one is to do anything that will generate contracts and money for the United States. Those three things strike me as the core strategic uh, drivers of American policy in the Middle East. Now, those three things are, are implemented by novices and ignorant novices in most cases and uncaring novices in many cases as well. So this is a really catastrophic situation. Yeah, but, but, but uh, I, I, I'll, I'll bring this question to um, Mr. Black, but then again, you see, Mr. Black, the, the problem here is you have people who seem to be poorly reading the changing dynamics in the Arab world. They're talking about key players, but they forget about the map and the emerging forces in the region. Let's take the example of Saudi Arabia for, the, for Trump. It's obvious he wants the Saudis to be the key players in the region, 
But when you look at the map, you look at what's happening in the region, it's a totally different reality. So what is the problem right here? Well, I think that I, I, I agree with a lot of what Rami Khoury has just said. I think the Trump focus on Iran is in many ways the key uh, to what is happening in elsewhere, and including with Saudi Arabia. I think it's important to recall at this, at this stage that when Trump became president, his first foreign visit was to Riyadh. That was an amazing thing to do. Um, why, why, why go there? Why not go to uh, Moscow or to Beijing or to London or to Paris, somewhere far more obvious in terms of American uh, global relationships? Trump went to Riyadh. Uh, the Saudis were absolutely ecstatic, uh, A, at that decision, and B, at what he said. And what he said mostly was about Iran. And it was about undoing what his hated predecessor, Barack Obama, had done. That was the uh, 2015 nuclear agreement. The Saudis were absolutely over the moon at that. And I think that a lot of what has happened since then flows from that moment, from that initial delighted reception of uh, Trump uh, in Riyadh, uh, whether it's moves on Iran or the green light, as people have often called it, for the Qatar crisis. And the Qatar crisis, it's worth pointing out, of course, that Trump acted in a way that appeared to suggest that he did not even know or, or knew but didn't care that Qatar was the home to the most important American base uh, in the entire Middle East. And that the the, that crisis was then followed by extraordinary statements from members of his own administration, from, from Rex Tillerson and from James Mattis, appearing to contradict exactly what the president had done. So it's not just a question of a lack of mm -hmm. uh, consistency and a focus on very, very specific targets. It's also an ignorance of long-standing previous U.S. policy and the implications of a sudden change uh, for uh, America's own position. So it's both ambition, but coupled with uh, ignorance and blindness to mm -hmm. what had gone before. Mr. Shalkawi, isn't, uh, isn't this something which is going to f put more strings on the uh, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman? I mean, the fact that Trump boasts of putting his own man on top in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the general perception among the Saudis, if they read the book, is that their Crown Prince is going to be politically beholden to the Americans and that ultimately he will definitely have to return the favors to the, Sa to the Americans. Well, I think there is a growing stigma now of Mr. Mohammed bin Salman having the support of Trump. So we will look at other possible ramifications of this in the Arab and the Gulf mind. At the same time, I think that there was a bad investment in the Riyadh summit because I think most of the Gulf nations or the Gulf governments thought that uh, having a good relationship with a powerful man at the White House would give them an umbrella or an extra cover of power. But then now, I, we, if we study his uh, strategy or would-be strategy, for example, towards Saudi Arabia, on the, on the one hand, he's supporting Ben Salman, but at the same time, he's criticizing the situation in, in Yemen. At the same time, we saw how he shifted from being anti-China to having good relationship with uh, President Trump. So he, this is more of a mood politics, and I don't think that there is this indication that Salman now can invest in a different path. What seems now is that it's going to add to this uh, fragmentation of Salman's base within the Saudis, either at the level of the clerics or the youth population. So we are looking at a figure who becomes more controversial. Jerusalem has been dominating headlines for weeks now. Trump formally recognized the city as Israel's capital last month. According to Wolf's book, this was something former advisor Steve Bannon had been planning since before inauguration. He allegedly said, day one, we're moving the US embassy to Jerusalem. Let Jordan take the West Bank, let Egypt take Gaza, let them deal with it or sink trying. Mr. Khoury, what would you command to this? Let Jordan take the West Bank, the Egyptians take Gaza, let them deal with it and sink trying. I was just going to actually jump in on that because that strikes me as one of the most telling statements in this book, at least on the Middle East segments. Uh, this sentiment of really total disdain and uncaring 
uh, abandon, about even your close allies like Jordan and Egypt are supposed to be close allies to the United States and, and, uh, and the top strategist in the White House is saying uh, let them um, deal with it or sink trying. It also says a lot about their ignorance about both Gaza and the West Bank and the realities uh, in, in those places that neither of them want to be part of Jordan or part of Egypt. They want to be part of an independent sovereign Palestinian state that's not occupied by Israel with Jerusalem, East Jerusalem as its capital. Uh, but this, what this tells us, what this should tell Sisi and King Abdullah in Jordan and, and Mohammed bin Salman and others around the region is Trump will deal with you like he, he's now calling Bannon a, a, a cheat and an idiot and a crook and a liar and, a, a, and he's lost his mind and whatever. So, he, you know, anybody who builds a relationship, political relationship, on a, a person like Donald Trump uh, is building a castle on, on sand. It's really uh, outrageous for anybody to expect Trump to be either consistent or uh, faithful. And we've seen it with his with his own people in the White House. We've seen how they think in the White House, and we've seen how people at the top level in the White House mm -hmm. turn against each other uh, immediately. And again, uh, the best uh, word I use is adolescence. These are like 14-year-old kids on a playground <laughs> uh, with no long-term strategic uh, values or goals, just trying to get uh, the most self-gratification they can. Mr. Black, Trump described his approach for the Middle East as the ultimate deal. Now, if you couple it with the revelations in the book, what would you say about it? I think the Trump's decision on Jerusalem is, is very, very revealing. And of course, the, the, there's no question. I think everybody would, would agree that Jerusalem is you know, the most difficult of those that bundle of difficult issues that lie at the heart of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. When Trump uh, carried out his long-standing election promise in early December and announced the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital and the plan to, at least eventually, to move the embassy there, um, it was a really, really striking, a really stark illustration of how he operates. He appeared not to give a dam for the peoples of the region locked into this terrible conflict. He appeared to be thinking solely about his own political base at home, his own domestic constituency. He said very pointedly, if you remember, uh, that previous American presidents had promised to uh, move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv mm -hmm. to Jerusalem. They'd failed to do so. He was the only one to deliver. He emphasized how he had delivered. He was flanked by the Vice President, Mike Pence, with his well-known uh, connections to the evangelical Christian lobby. It was all about delivering to his constituency. It had nothing whatsoever to do with resolving, helping resolve, I see your point. even trying to help resolve the world's most intractable conflict. That was a very, very revealing moment. And of course, mm -hmm. it has been enormously damaging, as has been his threat now to withdraw mm. funding from the understandably infuriated uh, uh, Palestinians. He doesn't give a damn. Uh, enormously damaging, as Mr. Ian Black uh, was describing the initiative for the Middle East. Mr. Mohammed Shalqawi, very briefly, whatever he had in mind about the Middle East, do you think that that idea is definitely going to be now irrelevant, shelved forever, given the developments on the ground, reactions among key players, even key players in the region? I think what we have learned so far, having studied Trump for two and a half years, he is into this mindset of political theatrics. He comes up with very controversial decisions, but he never shows a plan B. So once there is a resistance in the Middle East, then you, he will take us somewhere else. So we are not going to revisit these issues because he knows that they are undiplomatic and there is no way to have them implemented. So he is not a man who can resist the resistance coming the other way. Mr. Shakawi, Mr. Black, Mr. Khoury, good to have you on the show. And it's always interesting to listen to your insights. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashem Ahlbala, and the whole team here. Bye for now.